Uh, some call Pope Benedict a man at odds with the modern world, but the small details of his life tell a different story. He was the first pope to use Twitter, a tireless advocate for the respect and dignity of women and a champion of the new evangelization. Joining us tonight with more on the life and legacy of Pope Benedict XVI is Bishop Robert Barron, Bishop of the Diocese of Winona, Rochester. Great to see you as always, Your Excellency. Um, let's get right to it. I'd like to get your thoughts as we say goodbye to one of the great minds and leaders of the church. Well, it's a difficult time for the church. We've lost a great man and a man that had a huge impact. You know, think of his role at Vatican II. As a, as a young theologian, he helped to write some of the major documents. He then helped to explain the council to the wider world. He stood athwart those at the time who didn't want conciliar reform. And then in the years after the council, he stands athwart a Catholic progressivism that wanted to move beyond the council or undermine it. And I think those two forces are still present today. And Josef Ratzinger, along with Karl Wojtyla, John Paul II, I think represent the great way to interpret Vatican II, to affirm it, and but also to hold off a Catholic progressivism. So he played a, a pivotal role in the life of the church, and his um, example is one that we still need today. Yeah, and as you know, he really had a keen interest in the new evangelization and in spreading the message of the gospel really to the ends of the earth. He was the first pope, in fact, to use Twitter, and he did this in his 80s. Um, can you talk a little bit more about that? Yeah, I remember I was in Rome. Uh, I forget why, but I went to the audience, and it was the day when the pope inaugurated. I think it was his Twitter account or one of those things. And he was sort of having trouble. They had a camera on him, trouble finding out you know, which button to push. So I don't think he, he was very good at the tech side of it, but he understood the importance of it. He knew that this is one of the uh, new tools we had to use. John Paul II said that the new evangelization is is new in method and new in uh, enthusiasm and new in, in content. And so some of the tools that were needed were these social media. And Benedict, John Paul II, but I think Benedict especially understood that. Uh, and that was a huge uh, contribution that he made. Yeah, absolutely. And it's hard to get used to new technology for anybody, especially someone in that age. It really is impressive. Um, earlier this week, you called Vatican II one of the central events of Pope Benedict's life. Why is that? And also, does it strike you that the pope was a relatively young man at that point in his life, engaging in, in such an important event in the church? It's extraordinary. He was brought there as a uh, peritus or theological expert by Cardinal Frings of Cologne, who was a major player. And then Ratzinger writes a lot of speeches for Frings and helps him to formulate uh, the, the teaching of the council. A lot of the documents bear the marks of, of Josef Ratzinger. And so that, I think, was the defining event of his, of his life. He knew that um, defending Vatican II and also defending its integrity against uh, left-wing critics, that's the position he staked out. And it was the same position John Paul II staked out. And as I said, that's still much needed today because those two forces on the extreme left and extreme right are still present today. And so we need successors of John Paul II and Benedict XVI to carry on that struggle. Uh, he knew how uh, world-historically important Vatican II was. At the same time, he knew it was not a revolution but an evolution. And that's a very important contribution that he made. When I was coming of age in the church as a, as a young kid after the council, it was presented by our teachers as a revolution. And I think John Paul and Benedict both corrected that to say, no, an evolution indeed, a world historical event, necessary change for the church at the time, but an evolution in continuity with the ancient church, not a revolution in discontinuity with it. Maybe that's his greatest um, contribution. Yeah. Another thing I want to talk about is, um, you know, we heard that at the end of the funeral yesterday that some in the crowd, they held banners and they shouted sainthood now. Uh, Bishop Barron, your reaction to those chants, and do you think we have a future saint on our hands? My own feeling is that we should really follow the procedures of the church and we should be very sober and we should be very careful. We should assemble 
all the relevant testimony and evidence and so on, but let the process unfold. So I, I'm kind of opposed to the let's you know, canonize someone tomorrow. But, you know, he was undoubtedly a holy man. Anyone that knew him personally knew that. In terms of becoming a doctor of the church, I, I, I would declare him that tomorrow myself. Uh, the times I was privileged to hear him in St. Peter's Square when he would uh, give a catechesis and would talk about the great figures in the church, I always had the sense that I was listening to someone like John Chrysostom or like Ambrose or like Augustine. He just had that quality of a, of a church father. So I do think indeed he will be, as John Henry Newman recently was declared, or, or, John, or Newman you know, should be declared, um, I think he will be declared a doctor of the church. Now, Bishop Aaron, thank you so much for your time today. We always appreciate it. God bless you. Thanks for having me.